I was a little bit uh, mystified about uh, how art historians uh, wrote about uh, the chiaroscuro. I really thought it was a little bit strange. I did some kind of uh, research in uh, the literature, art history, about books written about chiaroscuro and what the other terms. Asking myself, is it really possible that they never kind of thought that uh, the chiaroscuro is not a technique, but it is the main deal, you know? That, uh, uh, the art historian always write about as if it's a technique for something, and uh, in a second I'm going to explain more. While in fact the chiaroscuro is the point, it's not like a technique for something else. Uh, so what I found out that when you uh, the type of uh, uh, stuff that they write about chiaroscuro, that there were two things that uh, uh, show frequently. Uh, the first one is drama. Chiaroscuro is a technique to create drama. Uh, and the second one is the chiaroscuro is a technique to create depth. Now, with, uh, so I started thinking about those two uh, answers. Uh, with a drama, you find it more like in a kind of pedestrian books about uh, how to do a chiaroscuro drawing. So they would say, uh, if you want your drawing to be, or painting to be dramatic, then we'll show you how to use the uh, chiaroscuro method. Now, the term dramatic uh, seems to be a little bit of a misnomer here because the question is, what is the drama? So, so people would say, well, you know, you put a cat and a dog and you do chiaroscuro, you get drama. You put a policeman and do the chiaroscuro, you get the drama. This is the kind of thinking that uh, goes into it. But, uh, so in other words, you have a scene, you put the chiaroscuro, it creates uh, additional drama. But of course, uh, common sense says that uh, if it works for every scene, so it's not that the scene becomes more dramatic, but the drama itself comes from the Kiela school. It's not that the cat and the dog become dramatic with the Kiela school, but when you put the Kiela school, the whole scene begins to be dramatic. Uh, it's not like amplification of how the cat and the dog are, you know. It's really that the Kiela school itself creates the drama. Uh, and, uh, and this is something that uh, really, uh, anyway, the only person that, who wrote something kind of interesting stuff actually uh, about Chiaroscuro was Leonardo. Uh, he kind of, he was one of the first people to uh, employ that in a much more uh, uh, subtle way than the Baroque, but you can see it already. And he said at some point, the chiaroscuro is what happened when you leave your home and you're in the threshold of your home, so a little bit inside, a little bit outside. Uh, and then you see this uh, uh, chiaroscuro, which really goes a long way towards what we are talking about. Uh, but it was never really developed into uh, a topic. So the drama is a kind of a just uh, misunderstanding of cause and effect. It's not that chiaroscuro uh, enhances the drama, but it creates the drama. It's the cause of the drama. It's not the effect of the drama. Um, so let's talk a little bit about depth. I forgot about it. You know, sometimes you forget about the most obvious stuff. That yes, uh, when you create like this type of shading. Uh, of course, it creates depth. Uh, you know, without it, it's much more flat, and with it, it creates depth. So let's talk a little bit about the issue uh, of depth here. Here you can see like all these stuff, and they're properly shaded. They really look uh, more uh, three-dimensional. And <coughs> the one book that I met, uh, that I found actually that talks about chiaroscuro 
says that this idea of how to create depth into uh, painting and drawing was one of the main European concerns between 1300 and 1600. Uh, so the question is, okay, so how do we think of this depth? Uh, and then when you think about it, then it becomes quite obvious that uh, depth relates to lifelikeness, and that's the connection. When you have something that is that you see, like all the how the different parts are connected to each other, uh, so so it creates it's not just uh, uh, an optical side, but but this type of chiaroscuro uh, shading uh, also elucidates the fact that some of the parts are. Uh, show themselves, other parts do not show themselves. It also, if you do it properly, it's clear that the light source comes from here. So you know why what is shown is shown and why is, what is not shown is not shown. And it is also clear that if it turns around, then other things would be shown and not shown. Uh, so that it's not just that the object gains three dimensionality. Uh, as an optical thing, but it gets kind of a complexity because you are you are aware more of the things, the different sides of the object, both in the literal and the figurative way, uh, that they keep on showing, unconcealing and concealing, unconcealing and concealing. So this gets you involved uh, in this drama of uh, unconcealment and concealment. And that's why, in my interpretation, uh, it becomes more lifelike. And that's why it is actually related uh, uh, to our concerns. Uh, however, uh, let's not jump too much and think that it is the depth which creates the lifelikeness uh, the depth itself, and the way to prove it uh, is to show uh, a situation okay. Georges de la I don't know if you know uh, this painter. It's more or less from uh, the same period. Uh, but the, the thing, thing about this stuff is that it's totally flat, and then it is clearly about the story of Luther Morgan right there. I'll show you a few more images so that you understand what I'm saying. Uh, So, here, this is a famous one. Ah, I forgot, we cannot really make it better. So, anyway, you can see how it is kind of a, a flat in an exaggerated way. Uh, many of them are, especially when you think that this was the uh, period of uh, Caravaggio and they really knew uh, how exactly how to create uh, depth. So, uh, this is even clearer, the absence of depth. Uh, and yet, uh, from uh, our point of view of how it uh, uh, tells the story uh, of, uh, you know, the self-showing, how you know, there's the light comes in into the scene and, and we see the people kind of reach in uh, and some of them are actually even portraits. Anyway, in my opinion, that shows that uh, depth has not that much to do with the ability to deliver this metaphysical drama of stepping into the limelight in order to show itself and create in the viewer this urge to focus into the scene because 
some kind of an unconcealment is happening kind of in front of your eyes, and that itself attracts you. So I, I just find it interesting uh, that uh, art historians talk about it in terms of depth of Kavos school war, but I think that this <coughs> is a kind of a more or less uh, a proof that you can have very effective cases of, uh, let's see, some of them are even more exaggeratingly flat. Oh, I cannot see, but I think, oh, this one perhaps? Yeah, this one is very flat. You see, this is the type of stuff that all this lack of articulation is kind of, uh, it's quite anachronistic for the, uh, for the time. Uh, anyway, uh, so this is one example. And the second example that I want to talk about, about, about the relation between depth and the ability to talk about the drama of going from the darkness to the light, what we're talking about, is actually the portraits of Warhol. So let's look at this one. Uh, what I always fasc found fascinating uh, in the portrait, again, first of all, they're completely flat. You know, there's really no real depth here. And it's not just that, but this is another interesting point that, uh, that because of the silk screen uh, technique, uh, <coughs> the face is almost decomposing in front of your eyes. Uh, it's kind of difficult to uh, hold it uh, together completely, and yet uh, the sense of uh, self-showing and going to the limelight and presenting yourself is completely intact. Uh, in spite of the lack of depth uh, and the lack of articulation, which is another thing that uh, people uh, are talking about in the Baroque period, about articulation, how important the articulation is for the dramatic uh, effect. Uh, and here you can really see that that is not exactly uh, the point either. And by the way, it's not like all of them uh, managed to do it in the same way. Uh, but This is the Jackie Kennedy. Uh, this is so clearly, you really get into an eye contact with her and you really see her exactly in this way of like going from the darkness to the light. This is completely uh, easy to see. Uh, but in others, it's a bit less. Sometimes it really loses them. Let's see if we quickly find one that. Uh, like maybe, maybe this one. Here it becomes a little unclear, you know, whether they really managed to capture an individual presence that goes through this process or not. This is kind of a, a borderline case. Uh, and there are many borderline cases, especially in his uh, 70s portrait. Uh, but otherwise, other, other of them are very strong depiction uh, of this drama of the, of the limelight. Uh, okay, so, so this is really, uh, again, a case where uh, uh, the phenomenological literature really helps art uh, history, I think, because uh, one of uh, the clear signs that, uh, uh, you know, without the stuff that we're talking about, there's something really inherent that is missing, uh, that is particularly troublesome when you start talking about portrait, because it's really not clear what kind of vocabulary we should really use to uh, talk about them, unless, and I think that this uh, uh, ideas of uh, Heidegger and uh, Merleau-Ponty really help. Okay, now uh, we will go, we will see something where art history actually really helped 
the discussion, Heidegger's uh, discussion. So we are really changing now. And now we are going to talk about, okay. So we spoke a little bit about still life and about portraiture. And I was wondering about other uh, aspect of Baroque art and to see how they uh, fit into the framework uh, that we were constructing here, especially because uh, I was wondering how all these things with light and darkness are going to be manifested in landscape painting. How, <laughs> my, even much to my surprise, because I cannot remember them, but what I realized, I mean, this is just, you know, the Baroque landscape, so you get here a kind of a representative of this type of, uh, of landscape. Some are from Italy, a lot of some are from Belgium, some are from Holland, they're really from different uh, places, and there are even uh, some German uh, landscape, and all of them have this property that there is, uh, there's a landscape, and there's like a part that is better lit. The attention of the viewer goes to that part. Uh, the light comes from the sky, usually. You can actually see it explicitly. But even if you don't, uh, you can just see that each and every one of them has this idea of clearing in the world, as uh, Heidegger says. There's a clearing in the world, and in that clearing, uh, the truth is taking place, the happening of truth is taking place, and we are looking at this place uh, and see exactly how Heidegger wants us to see that there is the earth, um, and there's light coming, and the light creates a clearing, and what we are seeing is really this idea that the world uh, is created uh, uh, as a clearing upon the earth, which is more or less how Heidegger wanted to talk about that. Uh, and you can see each and every one of them. It's basically the same thing. It's quite extraordinary, actually. And, and like you can say they are dramatic. Yes, they are dramatic, but there's always the same thing about this island of light within a larger thing that is actually a somewhat unusual uh, formation of the sky and the light comes and it lights something and we all kind of uh, focus on that part and have this kind of feeling of we are part of the truth <laughs> as it is happening. I think that it's uh, uh, extremely inviting to actually use the uh, this uh, type of terminology uh, here as well. Yeah, you wanna? Uh, I mean, I was actually a little bit surprised, I must say, that it fits so well to the stuff that we were talking about, and you can just see. Could we enlarge them in one or two? Enlarge one? Make it a bit larger? Uh, yes, yes. Let's, let's do that. Anyone in particular want to see? Let's see this one. Okay. Take this one. Uh, okay. So, so the first thing is that uh, when you look at it that way, then you also understand uh, what Heidegger was talking about a lot better. Because it really is about the earth. If you remember, we were talking about, about the earth and the world. Uh, and he talks about that uh, the world is founded on the earth. Uh, the earth juts through the surface into the world. And the world sinks back uh, into the earth. Uh, and sometimes there are clearings. And, and in these clearings, there's the happening of truth. That's where self-showing uh, takes place. Now, 
I would like to, but when I looked at it, I thought that a few things uh, should be added uh, to this uh, picture. The first thing is that we need not just an earth, but also a sky in the sense of Himmel, you know, that, uh, that is a bit like heaven also, right? So that the Erde and Himmel, sky is not exactly the same thing, it doesn't have this uh, connotation. That's the first thing. And the light that creates the clearing comes from the sky. So that's the second thing. Uh, it always comes uh, from the sky in a rather dramatic way. So there's the earth, there's the sky, and the light comes from the uh, sky to the earth. The second thing uh, is about the clouds, the role of the clouds. Uh, so the clouds are the natural concealers. In other words, they have the light, and then the clouds conceal the light. Uh, so they kind of hover around, and the way that they hover determines where the light is going to be and how much light it's going to be, and where the clearing is going to be. Th that's what the clouds, so they are like natural concealers that go around uh, and allow just some of the light to penetrate uh, on top of the earth. So I think that this is actually a good category. Uh, and the second category is the trees. So you have the sky, then you have the clouds, and then you have the trees. Uh, and the trees are, are a different kinds of concealers uh, than the clouds. The clouds hover, uh, and uh, the trees stay at the same time. Uh, that's the first uh, difference. And the second difference is that the trees shelter. So they don't just conceive the light, but they, sh they afford shelter. Uh, now, usually Heidegger talks about the earth as offering shelter. Uh, but here there's kind of a, the tree is like a representative of the earth that offers a little bit of shelter even above the earth. So it creates a little bit, and you can see again that uh, how consistent the whole thing is. So, let's look at these guys. These don't offer much uh, shelter. Okay. Uh, but some shelter. Uh, and so here, this is the earth. There's the sky. Uh, there are the clouds that allow this ray of light to come and light this period. And then there are these two people who are in this clearing of the light. Uh, and so they stand underneath the tree, but they actually here, they want the light. And this is kind of, this is like the human world. That's where it takes place, between the sky and the earth, and then under the clouds, and under the trees. These are kind of the four levels that happens there. Uh, and the reason why I'm uh, spending some time is because they're all the same. It really is. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit bizarre, actually, but uh, how similar it is. There's very little variation. Sky, clouds, trees, and then the little guys underneath, that's the, where the world is, you know, between the trees and the earth, under the clouds. Uh, let's look at this one.
another one. See, here's the clearing is here. Those naked trees, you know, the dark clouds, but there's one ray of light that kind of lights this part. Uh, if you have any kind of thoughts, for these are fairly new uh, thoughts that I had here, but so please uh, uh, tell me if you see uh, some other stuff that I don't, but I find it really uh, quite extraordinary the extent to which this really is the topic of this uh, landscape. I mean, is there any doubt about it? You see one and another one, another one, they're all kind of the same. Uh, sometimes they are like man made structures, which is also kind of interesting. You know, when there are man made structures, uh, and they do make a difference, but they're also juts, like the trees, they juts from the earth. So they really have, again, this sense of uh, things that shelter inside uh, and that they block the light, so they're also at the same time uh, kind of, uh, um, they also concealers, like, uh, uh, they create concealment as well. Uh, yes. And uh, this, I think, is really a kind of a proof. Oh, where is this one? I guess that one there. I think that this may be the most uh, convincing evidence of why the, uh, this, of why the uh, phenomenological framework really helps art history because, again, if it's not about that, then what is it about? And why are they so much similar? And why is there always this kind of shadow, place of shadows and light, like exactly in the same way? Uh, at the same time, uh, it also makes it pretty clear what does it mean uh, that uh, this painting somehow preserve the happening of truth that happened uh, in some unspecified time before. And they really kind of keep it. And here it is not so much about the drama uh, of unconcealment as, as the scene where the unconcealment takes place. Uh, it's like, it's like the uh, stage of a theater. Like that's where the truth happens. Uh, uh, this I think is like what the, the topic uh, of the landscape uh, painting. And sometimes uh, there are also things that have both, for example, in San Jerome in the desert. So you see something like that, but then also you, you focus also on the individual person. Uh, in most of the landscape, you don't get to focus on individual. You just kind of see them as those beings who live under the trees and the clouds and on the earth. This is kind of the, the way that... Uh, it creates like a vision of, uh, of the happening of truth, how, about what do you need in order to do this phenomenography uh, and how to preserve it and how to preserve it in such a way that it keeps on happening when you watch it uh, in the right frame of mind. Because this is exactly what happens here after so many uh, years, we still see the happening of truth in those like little islands of light. So, yeah? Um, but is then every figure that you depict in a painting, for example, unconcealed? Even though if they hide by the trees or something? Uh, let, let's see exactly. Uh, 
let's look at these guys. Okay, so this one. Uh, in many of the cases, they gravitate towards the light. The people that you see gravitate. No, this is not the one I wanted. Okay, so the people gravitate towards the light and they are kind of partly uh, uh, unconcealed uh, because they are in these clearings over here, uh, but at the same time, they are also witnesses for a, a greater happening that takes place in all the clearings, not just them but in the entire area where the light shines. And that's why they're like witnesses of, of a greater scene of a truth that is happening. Uh, did I answer the question? Um, um, I think so. I'm not sure. Try again. Uh, what happens to them in the sense that... Uh, I don't know if it happens, but that's just like theoretically they can also stay unconceived in the future. Well, uh, here it, where it becomes, if they are to be visible at all, they have to have some light. If they have some light, there's some unconcealment. Mm -hmm. So this is clear. If they were completely in the dark, we wouldn't be able to really see them. Uh, at the same time, uh, they don't seem to be, well, here it's actually different. Like this woman on the horse, it seems to be more aware, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, they're mostly, uh, when you look at them, they have other interests in mind except the self-presentation, you know. So you ask, well, what are they doing? So on the one hand, you say, this is their world. And we see it when there's a clearing around it. So it becomes visible to us. And they know that it becomes visible. And so they kind of live as uh, partly visible, temporarily, uh, as being. I think that's what happens there. Uh, so it is not exactly this type of unconcealed, like uh, conscious unconcealment that we were talking about with portraiture. It's something partial, somehow. There are witnesses to greater happening that has to do with unconcealment. And because they are stand with it, so they are part of the things that happen there. But it's not really focused on them that much, I would say. Uh, So, uh, so it is a little bit uh, too late to start with the next uh, topic. So uh, let's, uh, let's call it a day. Uh, yeah? Those paintings? Yeah. I think so. I think so because uh, if you're, you know, with phenography, you have to ask for the intention. What is the intention here? And in my opinion, let's take another one. Uh -huh. Let's say this one, for example. Uh, I think that the intention here. Uh, is to show uh, a clearing on the earth that allows the truth to happen in that clearing. 
so so in so far as in the clearing there's the happening of truth uh, what you are trying to, uh, to what you are trying to preserve or to transmit is actually another slightly different instance of uh, unverborgenheit of unconcealment uh, so it's not that different from this point of view from the portrait or the still life the way uh, we spoke about it it's just that I find it kind of interesting to introduce the, the the sky and the clouds and the trees and then the earth so to stratify it a little bit and to think about the whole thing that uh, there's light coming from the top and then there are the clouds that kind of uh, conceal some of it but sometimes they part and they allow the light to come in and then there are the trees which are also natural concealers so they also intervene in where the clearing uh, is going to be and then comes the earth and the people are usually uh, painted very close to the earth uh, as, uh, as if especially if they are in the clearing so it becomes the earth the cleared earth let's say becomes the platform where the truth of humans take place let's say that uh, that's how I, I uh, that's how I see it. Uh, yes, actually, there was one more thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, which again, it actually, it's an entirely different topic, but it's kind of interesting that uh, it is about the Baroque church weird images really where is the normal baroque church like this one for example okay so this is like uh, a typical uh, baroque facade right so uh, uh, here it doesn't look that way but in many of them there's a hole there and the hole is there in order for light to come in that was the point Many of them actually were earlier churches where the facade was changed. And one of the constant thing in the facade is always like this uh, round high window where a whole big ray of light can come into the church. Uh, which is again, I think an evidence of uh, somewhat similar concerned uh, which in every case it is actually uh, th there are some similarity but uh, it's also obvious that any kind of real articulation of what happens with architecture would really take us to another uh, direction and yet at the same time the fact that the in the facade of the baroque church there's this device for bringing the light in like a like a round ray of light into the church, so it creates a clearing in the church. You see, because when you have it and the sun is in the right place, then there's this circular light area in the interior of the church. So then when you pass by and you stand inside, so there's an unconcealment in the church, inside, uh, which is also something that uh, I find uh, kind of interesting uh, that it is so, you know, that in every area of the Baroque there really is some kind of a very clear sign of interest in this issue of the chaos school, or the light, the darkness, passage from the light, the darkness. It's really something that seems to be uh, in every aspect uh, of the Baroque. <coughs> and yet, there's very little explicit articulation uh, of this idea, which is really quite strange. Okay, let's call it a day. Thank you.